<laughs> Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. This is Portland Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and we're here live at the Glennie Ranch up in Vancouver, Washington. So thank you all for joining us. Those that are here live uh, in person, those who are live streaming on uh, Judy Glennie's Facebook page, remember you can get it at the website, portlandbiblechurch.com. And you can go there and uh, the top of the home page is a drop down menu. You can go down. There's a link to YouTube there so you can check it out later. We also have audio of all the messages for many, many years in the past that you can check out. And a number of uh, probably about 80 or more studies that are printed that you can look at and uh, download or study if you wish. Also, of course, we have class at... Uh, Thursday at 7 o'clock uh, right here and we have uh, they're studying the concepts of leadership looking at many of the great leaders in the Old Testament and of course through the Kings as well so that's on Thursday after Thursday class we have our prayer meeting and so if you have prayer requests or praises give us a call give me a call or one of the men and we'll be sure to include your prayer or praise uh, on Sunday we have class at 10 o'clock the last hour and then 11 15 now after our second service today we have about a half hour of singing the great hymns of the church so uh, hopefully you can join with us for one of those uh, also I forgot to mention Judy Glennie my wife on Wednesday has a ladies Bible study right here at our house so if you ladies are free at that time two o'clock in the afternoon she's going through first John excellent excellent study uh, anytime you look at first John it just has some uh, marvelous passages to consider in there and so uh, it's also our custom to take a few moments again at the beginning of each of our classes to make sure that we're in fellowship that we have no unconfessed sin because uh, Paul tells us we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us at the moment of salvation. But subsequent to that, if we have sin in our life, we lose the enabling or the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like uh, the light that's uh, plugged into the wall, but the switch is turned off. So we have the power, but we need to turn on that switch. And that's how we do it is through confession of sin. The Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance any sins, mental, verbal, or overt. And of course, we can acknowledge them to the Father. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. It says, if we, believers, confess our sin, name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So at that point, we have the enabling or the filling of the Holy Spirit to understand the mind of Christ, which is the Word of God. So with that in mind, and in preparation for our study in this second service, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege we have of being members of your royal family through faith alone in your Son, Jesus Christ alone. Thank you that he has provided our magnificent salvation by his finished work once and for all on the cross, bearing all of our sins and providing us with forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. We thank you for these things, we pray. As we study your word in the second session, that we would be edified of soul, encouraged, challenged, and motivated. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And he, he says uh, to fear not, for he is with us. Be not dismayed, he says, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word in this second session to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6 and verse 18. 6, 18. We spent the first hour this morning looking at verse 17, basically. And in verse 17, we see that God has made a promise which cannot be changed or altered because of his immutability. A big theological term that means that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can't change his mind. So whatever he says, that he will do. And then he confirmed it with an oath. And that extends into this next verse 18. And so the two unchangeable things, as we said <clears throat> already, refer to the promise for Abraham, it was the promise of a son, of course, and then that promise was sealed by a covenant or an oath. 
the oath extended beyond simply a son. It extended to descendants, uh, to nations, and to a land for Israel in the future, as well as royalty and kings, leading to, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ and the future reign uh, of Jesus during that millennial kingdom. All of that in this Abrahamic covenant, all courtesy of a promise that God made to an individual named Abraham. And, of course, uh, with that, a an oath or a covenant was signed, as it were, sealed and delivered, and is guaranteed. And all of that is uh, for a purpose. And the purpose is for our encouragement. And so in the rest of this verse, as we get to the second part of verse 18, it says here, uh, we may have strong encouragement. So the point of all of this promise and all of this covenant is so that we can have encouragement. Encouragement, of course, and consolation. Uh, the word in the Greek is <clears throat> paraklesis. It's where we get the uh, word for the Holy Spirit. He's called the parakletos. Parakletos in the Greek. Para means alongside of. Kletos comes from the verb kaleo in the Greek, which means to call. So it means to call alongside. So to call alongside means to bring somebody alongside who can help you, to can uh, encourage you to, as it were, share your pain. And therefore the parakletos, or the Holy Spirit, is called the comforter. And so here it says we may have strong comfort or consolation, uh, or I like the word encouragement as well. So whether you use consolation, comfort, or encouragement, uh, this is what we see coming from the fact that God made a promise to Abraham. Now we noted in the first hour as well as last week that the Abrahamic covenant is the basis of everything, I mean everything in the Bible from the time of Abraham on. It's an unconditional covenant and it guarantees not only the descendants of Abraham all that was promised, but also all nations will be blessed in Abraham, which includes all of the Gentiles. Paul clearly says that we are spiritual seed of Abraham. Many of us are not Hebrew, we're not Jewish people. We are not uh, of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're considered Gentiles of the line of, uh, of uh, uh, Ham or Japheth and uh, not of the line of Shem as uh, through the line of, uh, of Noah. But rather that we are Gentiles, nevertheless, we are spiritual heirs, Paul tells us, of Abraham. And therefore, we do not usurp what has been promised to the nation and the people of Israel, to the Hebrew or Jewish people, but rather uh, it's kind of an addendum to all nations that will be blessed because of it. And so Paul says that because of Abraham, we as Gentiles receive the overflow blessing. And so it's kind of like we got on the bus late, but we're still going the same place. We still get the same blessing. Abraham's descendants get the land. They have the people and the King Jesus who came from that line uh, spelled out explicitly under the Davidic covenant, uh, we also share because he's our savior as well. So we do get the blessing and the overflow of the Abrahamic covenant. So when the writer of Hebrews is saying, we uh, all, not just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles, we all may have strong encouragement. The word strong is the word iskaros in the Greek, uh, which has to do with ability and power. Uh, in fact, it's used sometimes for skill. The skill that we have, to, we have dunamis, which is uh, inherent power, kind of like dynamite, inherent power. That's where we get the word dynamite, inherent power. But this isn't that word. This is iskaros, which is uh, basically the skill and so it might say you have the encouragement, the strong encouragement to do whatever it is. In other words, that we do through the filling of the Spirit, whatever God has designed for us to do. And so we have the strength of uh, function, we might say, uh, because of the encouragement, those of us who have fled for refuge. And so we fled for refuge as believers at the point you accept Jesus Christ, you have escaped the evil of the world. Now, sometimes we feel like we're still oppressed by the evil of the world because we live in the world. But Jesus said, you are in the world, but you're not of the world. And he makes a play on words there. The preposition ek in the Greek shows us that we are in the world, en, but not ek, out from the source of the world. In other words, we are not under the auspices or authority of the evil in the world. And therefore, while we live in the world, we are not of the world 
possessed by the evil principles of the world, but rather we live above it. So we have escaped, as it were, the world. Uh, it's kind of like you, we're in the world, but we somehow escape the cosmic influences. Now, I know that if you watch the media and listen to uh, a lot of the news, sometimes you get embroiled in the uh, evil and the cosmic system. But you should be able to live above that because we have escaped it. We've taken refuge. Now, I like the fact that he uses this word uh, in the Greek for refuge. Uh, it's a Greek word, kata fugo. Uh, uh, fugo means to flee. Kata means according to a standard. So it's a compound word in the Greek. K-A-T-A, P-H-E-U-G-O. Uh, uh, -E kata fugo. The P-H sound is a, a, a F sound almost. And fugo means to flee, and kata means according to a standard. It comes to mean to flee as a refugee. And so it's kind of like uh, we hear a lot about refugees refugees coming to this country from other countries and uh, what are they doing they're fleeing oppression they're fleeing evil and so uh, they come to this country for freedom sadly many that have lived in this country want to destroy our freedom and yet people who come from foreign countries where there is terrible oppression come here for the freedom that we have albeit diminishing day by day nevertheless we're still the greatest country on earth and uh, the freest country on earth and so people come here for uh, refuge and therefore they're called refugees they're escaping from the evil and the tyranny where they came from uh, in their homeland and so we have fled the tyranny of the old sin nature we have fled the tyranny of Satan and the demon hordes and we're above that because we now have the indwelling and hopefully the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit so we take refuge well, when did we take that refuge? When did we escape? We escaped when we believed in Jesus Christ. And day by day, as refugees, we're in the camp of heaven, which is our refugee camp. And so we think about our heavenly position. Our thoughts should be on things above, not on things on the earth. And Paul tells us, think on the things above, not on the earth, because we are in that place of safety, a place of <coughs> refuge. In the Old Testament, there were called cities of refuge. It's kind of an interesting concept. Uh, we have nothing like it today. The closest thing, <clears throat> the closest, <coughs> pardon me, the <clears throat> excuse me, the closest thing we have to it today uh, would be jail. Uh, but that really doesn't do it because a person who commits a crime is put in jail. In the ancient world, if you committed a heinous crime, uh, worthy perhaps of the death penalty, you could escape to a city of refuge. And uh, you had to stay there because uh, the brother or a relative of the one who had been murdered, now not first degree murder, that was a capital offense, but if someone was murdered, uh, you know, we call it the, uh, the lesser, in other words, an accidental death, uh, the ma family member could take out revenge on you and kill you, but if you were in that city of refuge, you couldn't be attacked. Now, if you went outside the city limits and a relative of the person who had been killed uh, sees you, then they could take uh, justice, as it were, into their own hands. We have nothing like that. We call them vigilantes today. But this was a, a legal process under the system in Israel, under the Mosaic Covenant, and they, the kinsmen could actually take vengeance on the person who had uh, caused the death of, of uh, an, another a member of his family, the one who was going to take the wrath into or the vengeance in his own hand. So they would escape to a city of refuge. I think it's kind of interesting uh, that uh, although that is for a person who had committed a crime, the idea of taking refuge away from criminality is kind of the reverse, but that's what he has in mind. At least some of the commentary suggested that. And once again, this word only occurs two times in the New Testament, once here and once over in Acts 14.6. might look at that since it's the only other place that we see this in Acts chapter 14, verse 6. Here we see an example when, of course, uh, 
uh, Paul was having difficulty, Paul and Barnabas, and they were going from one city to another presenting the claims of Jesus Christ, and they were many times attacked, many times they had to escape. Verse 2 says, But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore they spent a long time speaking boldly with reliance on the Lord who was be bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by them. And then we get down to verse 6. It says, They became aware of those who were uh, going to attack them, and they fled to the cities uh, Laconia, Lystra, and Derby, and the surrounding region. And so they took refuge, basically. The same word is used. They fled to these cities so they could escape the persecution because they were presenting the claims of Jesus Christ. I guess, in a sense, it's the same way with us. We have escaped the persecution, basically, by being in the Lord. And so our heavenly home is that new Jerusalem, and so we take refuge, and we're encouraged. And that's what he has in mind here. We may have strong ability and skill and encouragement that is those of us believers in Jesus Christ who have taken refuge who have fled as it were as it says in Acts 14 6 and here two places so as to lay hold of so as to lay hold of here is the next phrase it's an infinitive which means to grasp or to take hold of and how do we take hold of this refuge we take hold of it day by day and moment by moment by what? Faith. Faith as believers. We have faith when we come to Christ. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't stop there. Every day we are encouraged. And those of us who take refuge by laying hold of through faith what is set before us. And what's set before us? The hope. Hope, of course. The Greek word elpis means hope. We have defined it many times. The Greek word hope is certainly different from the hope in English. And I feel like I keep repeating this, but it's important because when we say hope, a lot of times people say, well, uh, I hope it doesn't get too much hotter today. You know, well, it's getting pretty hot. And so that, that hope is not going to happen because it is going to get hotter uh, here. And so, or we say, uh, uh, I hope it doesn't rain and then we'll play a ball game. Well, maybe it's too hot and it doesn't rain, but hope is tenuous. In the Greek New Testament, the word elpis doesn't just mean I hope so with any doubt. It means certainty. The only doubt is when it will occur. And so the hope here is certain uh, anticipation without an understanding of when the realization will occur. And so what is set before us in the city of refuge, basically, uh, by being faithful in Christ, is the hope. The hope, the confident anticipation that is set before us. What's the confident anticipation that's set before us? Of course, it is the heavenly hope, the new Jerusalem, our home with Jesus, our rulership in the millennial kingdom, the rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And not only that, blessings in time. We have times of adversity, yes, and then we have R&R, &R, times of rest and relaxation. Under the faith rest technique, we claim the promises of God under adversity, and we rest in those promises until the adversity passes. That's during this life. But ultimately, there is reward in heaven, reward at the judgment seat of Christ, and pleasures forevermore. Also, blessings in time interspersed with adversity to test us, to test our growth. All right, so that brings us then back to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19. <clears throat> but it doesn't really end. The sentence doesn't really end there. Again, it seems like it does because they start off with the uh, word, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Now, the word this really does not occur there. As a matter of fact, let's see if it shows over here in verse 19. If you have a New American Standard, many times, not always, but many times, it will have the literal interpretation or translation from the Greek. If you have a New American Standard, look in the margin. Uh, this hope, it says literally, which we have. And so here, the hope which which we keep on having. And so this hope, there's no word hope here at all. The hope was in the previous verse. The hope was in verse 18. There's no hope in verse uh, 19. The references to the hope in verse 18. It simply says, which, which we keep on having. And they've added the word hope. 
which we have or which hope we have. We can supply the word hope. I think that the New American Standard should have put this word hope in italics. Usually when it's a word that's not there in the English, they put it in italics. And so I don't know if you have a new New American Standard. Maybe they've made that correction, but it really shouldn't be in the, it's not in the text at all. There's no word for hope. Uh, it may be in the majority text. I'm not sure. I think I used the majority text and I didn't see it there. But at any rate, the word hope does not occur. It's implied so it's okay, which hope, if you like, we have. The word have is the normal Greek word for have. Echo, E-C-H-O, means to have and to hold for your very own. It's a present tense, which means we constantly have this. As believers, we always have it from the moment of salvation till the moment we're taken to be with the Lord. We have it. The active voice, we are the ones who have it. The indicative mood, it's real. We have the reality of the hope, the confident anticipation that the Lord will deliver us, bless us in eternity, reward us at the judgment seat, and intermittently bless us during our lives, even though we have periodic periods of adversity. So we keep on having is the way we translate this. We keep on having, and then it is as an anchor. It's not an anchor, it's as an anchor, and we have the comparative host here, as an anchor. So we know when we use that, that it's a metaphor. What does the anchor do? <laughs> well, if you have ever been on a boat, you know that somewhere on that boat you have an anchor. And you don't put it down unless you want to stop somewhere. If you're in reasonably shallow waters, the anchor will go down and hit the bottom. If not, it would certainly slow the ship from moving any place that you're at, although you can still drift. But an anchor is one that secures you, usually in harbor. And so the anchor, and when we think of it metaphorically uh, here in its literal sense, it's a ship in a safe harbor. And so an anchor is the ship placed in a safe harbor and the anchor secures it. So it's not going to drift out to sea because you come to port and uh, you may tie it to the pier or there may be no pier to tie it to. And you may have to get in a boat and, uh, and row to shore because of uh, uh, reefs or other things that prohibit you from tying up. So you drop anchor and the ship will stay right there in the harbor even though it's not tied up. But it is, in a sense, secure because of the anchor and so uh, the anchor is our stability and puts us in safe harbor we might say it's our stability in times of trial and difficulty uh, in the, the ship uh, picture it would be in rough seas uh, if you have a, a storm and your ship is in harbor even if it doesn't have tied up to the dock but you have the anchor down that ship is secure it may it may rock to and fro uh, but uh, it will be secure in harbor because the anchor is down and secures it. So that's the idea. This word only occurs four times in the New Testament, and the other three times actually refer to actual anchors. So here we have it in its metaphoric sense, the only place it's used that way. And this is one of my favorite, favorite passages because this anchor that we have enters into the Holy of Holies, into the third heaven, into the very presence of God. We've taught it when we weren't here, but now we're actually here. And so what's our confidence? We have a lifeline. We have an anchor securing us into the very presence of the throne room of God. Boy, that's, a, that's an amen, hallelujah, if ever there was one. And so we are secure because we are tied in and constantly anchored. We keep on having, it says, as an anchor. There's the similarity. It's not a literal anchor, but in the sense of the picture, it does the same thing. And so we see this word. It's interesting. I think we get our English word from this. It's A-G-K-U-R-A. A-G-K-U-R-A, and sometimes in this sense, the G is uh, actually uh, transliterated with an N, so it'd be Ankura. Ankura sounds familiar. So I think we get the word anchor from this Greek word, Ankura, uh, which actually is used, as I said, only four times. And here, the only place it's used as a figure of speech. So that makes it very important. The writer of Hebrews tries to think, how can I show that we're secure and that we have a presence with the Lord? We are seated in Christ, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. So we're in Christ. Christ is in God, seated at the right hand of the Father. And how are we secure? We have an anchor. One pastor called it the upside-down anchor. 
when we think of a ship, we throw it over the side and the anchor goes down to the, you know, to the seabed. But we have an anchor that goes up to heaven and goes into the throne room of God. So you, you remember the anchor, what an anchor looks like. There are all kinds of them. I think of the traditional Navy anchor that they use. Uh, and it kind of has a, a hook on each side and the prong at the end. And that goes up right into the very throne room of God. And I think about uh, when we die, uh, we go right up the anchor chain. And so we go where we are in time, up the anchor chain to our presence, seated at the right hand of the Father. We are there positionally right now, but we will be there experientially at the rapture or after death. So we have this wonderful anchor of the soul. Uh, the idea is connected with the whole study of what we call positional truth. We are in Christ, and all through the New Testament, we have prepositions like en, in, or eis, into, or epi, upon. We are in Christ, and every time we see that prepositional phrase, or any of those prepositions, it indicates that when we believe in Christ, we enter into union with him in his position, seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, to show a couple verses for this positional truth without going through the whole study, uh, which is rather lengthy, and we've done it many times. Look at the Gospel of John, chapter 10. John, chapter 10, verse 28. John 10, 28. <clears throat> now here, of course, Jesus was talking about the uh, who he was at the Feast of Dedication. And uh, they were saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, verse 25, I told you, and yet you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. Basically, he is telling them that he is the Christ. He said, I told you. Told you what? That I am the Christ, that you don't believe. So the works speak for themselves. Uh, and then he says, My sheep those who are going to come to Christ, those hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. There's eternal security. They can't uh, lose eternal life. They'll never perish, and nothing can snatch them out of my Father's hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and nothing is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Here's where we have the essence of God, the Father, and the essence of God, the Son, as being one. Then go to chapter 14, verse 20. As it were, the rest of the story. John 14, 20. Here he's speaking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth in verse 17. He abides with you, but he will be in you. He said, I will not leave you as orphans, verse 18. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will not see me anymore, but you will behold me because I live. You shall live also. Look at verse 20. In that day, you shall know for a fact what you hopefully know now, but you'll know it because it'll be true in the person that I am in the Father and you are in me and I in you. So Jesus is the identical essence as the Father, but he is also in the Father positionally and we are in Christ. So we're in Christ, in God. This is the whole concept in a nutshell of positional truth. John 10, 28 through 30 and John 14, verse 20. All right, so this is the idea of positional truth. Now, we have shown and somewhere on our website we have a, a picture that may look a bit confusing. I'm going to put it up here just for a moment. And so I don't have a way to show this on the overhead, but I'm just holding it up. You can go to the website and you can look under the charts and graphs and you can see positional truth. Now, it looks a bit confusing because I put a lot of verses with it. And so for those viewing this, it might look m mystical, but it really represents several things. One, on the uh, on the left side, we see the cross. That's where we enter the plan of God. Then instantaneously, we're entered into union with Christ. That's the circle above. And so over to the uh, right side, 
you see the circle. That's the sometimes the top circle, we call it. But it's actually a sphere. It's a sphere of being positionally in Christ. And you are entered into union with Christ. Down below, we have a second circle or sphere. That's the sphere of time or life. You can see the center sphere indicates being filled with the Spirit. There's a darker sphere outside. That, of course, is your life when you're outside of fellowship. But as a believer, you're either in or out. When you confess your sins, you're back into that bottom circle. But notice there's a connection between that circle or sphere and the top sphere above. And that is that link, and that's the line. And at the very top of that, I think that you can see uh, there's an anchor there. I don't know if you can see it, if it's clear enough. Maybe I can get a little closer there. And you can see there's an anchor there. Well, you see that anchor? That's the anchor that we have, and that's where I got it, was right here in this passage in Hebrews 6 and 19, this anchor of the soul. So it connects our position in time right into the very presence of the, of the Godhead uh, in Christ, in God. And so that is the picture that the writer of Hebrews is stressing. Now, if you go to the website, you go to Charts and Graphs, I believe that one is posted there, so you can download it. We have some here for the folks that are with us. Most of you have seen this before, and we have developed the entire study of positional truth. The study of positional truth, to me, is one of the most important studies in the Bible because it has so many features and explains so many difficult things. Just one example, when we talk about in Christ, we are circumcised in Christ. Well, all of us uh, know that circumcision is only done uh, logically on the male. Uh, some societies do it on the female. It's a barbarous, terrible uh, uh, injustice. And so it is not what the scripture is teaching. Yet, every believer is said to be circumcised in Christ. How is that true? Well, it's true positionally because Christ was circumcised on the eighth day according to Jewish law. And the circumcision goes all the way back to the uh, Abrahamic covenant. That became the sign after he made the covenant. Then there was that specific sign in addition to the oath that was for the Abrahamic covenant for all of the Hebrew people. And so it was physical circumcision of the male. But we as believers in Christ are circumcised in Christ, positional truth. Paul also talks about the fact that when we died, we died with Christ. Well, we didn't die with Christ. We weren't even alive when Christ was here. And Paul hadn't died with Christ. It was writing after the death of Christ. So how can he say when we died or he died with Christ? He died with Christ positionally when he believes in the Messiah. Then positionally he shares that death. He also shares, as we do, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension and session of Jesus Christ in the heavens. Therefore, positionally, not only did we die with Christ, but we were alive with him in the heavenly places right now. And the only way that that's true is positional and judicial situation where we are judicially placed into that union and of course the writer of Hebrews acknowledges that by using this metaphor of the anchor now all of that is simply to say we can be encouraged we have a link into the very presence of God and he also talks about uh, in the previous one of the previous chapters I think here trying to remember which one it was but uh, well actually it was back in chapter 4 Look at chapter 4, verse eight, uh, 16, where we saw this before. Hebrews 4, 18. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, we can do that because we enter into the veil. We enter into the veil positionally. Jesus Christ entered into the veil literally by going into the third heaven in the tabernacle that is the original tabernacle. Yes, apparently there's a tabernacle in heaven and therefore Moses constructed a tabernacle based on the tabernacle in heaven, the model. God gave him the instructions for that. And so we have this tabernacle and it's similar in the sense that there's a holy of holies the very presence of God. And he says Jesus entered as a forerunner into the behind the veil, into the Holy of Holies. That's what the writer of Hebrews is going to talk about, by the way, in chapter 7. So that's a preview of coming attractions. So he's not leaving this alone. He's going to come back again and again, giving us the confidence that we can go right into the very presence of God 
in our prayers because Jesus, the forerunner, has gone behind the veil. He's gone into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of his Father, where he is now seated at the right hand of majesty on high. So this anchor of the soul is such a critical thing. And then he says, both secure and firm. We have two descriptive adjectives here. Uh, secure, I like the word secure. It's the uh, Greek word aspeles. Uh, aspeles, the alpha privative. When you have a word in Greek many times, they take the word speles and they put an a in front of it. And that means not. And the word spales comes from the verb uh, spalo, which means to fall in Greek. And so not fallen is the idea. And so both unfallen, we might say unfailing, unfalling. In other words, we can't fall out of our position in heaven. We're hooked in with that anchor and we can't fall out. The ship cannot drift a horse off course because we have the anchor of the soul. We can burn the ship up. But it's going to stay right there because we have the anchor of the soul. What do you mean you can burn the ship up? Well, you can die the sin unto death. You can live a horrible, sinful life. But the ship stays anchored because we have the anchor of the soul. Spiritual security of the believer, even if we die the sin unto death as believers. Even if we're under discipline and the ship becomes a wreck and it sits there, it's still anchored, and you still have that presence in the throne room. You're just not aware of it, and you're looking at the ship, and you say, it's just, it's a disaster, or it's burned up. Well, that's the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, you're saved, <laughs> that ship, the wreckage of it is saved yet, so as through fire. So it's not failing, it's not falling, it's secure, it's firm. And then we have the word that's translated firm, babios. That means reliable, dependable. That goes back to the promise of God. And so the fact that we have the anchor that's dependable. You know, you might have a little tiny anchor that only weighs 30 or 40 pounds. Well, in rough seas, you throw that anchor over and what happens? The ship dry, goes and it just drags that anchor along because it doesn't weigh enough. We need to have a heavy anchor so that's going to hold that ship in place. You can't have a little 20-pound anchor. Oh, here's our anchor. You throw it over, and the ship drifts out, and the anchor just drags along the bottom because there's no weight to it, no strength to it. And so it says it's firm, it's strong, it's a reliable anchor. It's an anchor of the soul that is unfailing. It doesn't fall off the end of the anchor chain, you know. Uh, and uh, it, it's strong and heavy, and therefore the anchor we have holds in the very presence. We have, I think there's a song, and I can't remember the, what is it? My Anchor Holds, is that the name of the song? Yeah, there's a hymn like that. Maybe we can find it and sing it. I think we have it in our uh, repertoire of songs. And uh, next time we come to it, I'll say, there's the anchor song. So uh, it's a beautiful hymn that talks about the anchor. And that's what it's talking about. It's secure and it's firm and it's not failing. And it's heavy, heavy anchor that holds us steadfast. Uh, we see this same word used in Hebrews chapter 2, 2. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2, it says... If the word spoken through the angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense. Well, the word that came through the angels and their information, they came at the behest of God, instructing them as they did throughout uh, the Old and even the New Testament, as they came to Mary and told her about the birth of her son, as they came to uh, others and gave information. They, uh, it's unalterable. The word unalterable here is babios. It means certain, sure. And then again, we see it over in chapter 3 and verse 14. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast. There is the holding fast, the beginning of our assurance, firm till the end. The word firm is babayas. We need to be strong. Here it has to do with the believer's, con uh, 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 the believer's uh, strength. Uh, and firmness as he goes through his Christian experience. So we have that. And then we have the second half of verse 19. Let's go back to verse 19 now. 619 of Hebrews. So it says, which, hope if you like, we have as an anchor of the soul. And they've added again the word hope. Here they vitalize it because it, it is talking about the hope and the anchor that causes us to have that hope. Both sure and secure. 
certain and steadfast. Any way you want to, I like the word strong for steadfast, and the first one, unfailing, unfailing and strong. And one which, here it is, enters within the veil. Now that tells us where it goes. Well, this goes back to the Old Testament, the uh, the tabernacle that Moses was built uh, had had built in the wilderness, and it had the tent of meeting. And what was it? There was the outer area, and there was the holy of holies, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And they put it behind a veil. And the high priest could take an offering in there once a year on the day of atonement for himself and for the people for another year anticipating, as we understand, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would do that once and for all. And here it says he did it once and for all. After the resurrection, in the ascension, he ascended into the very presence of God, entered into the veil. Well, if he's there and we're in him and he's in the Father, he's at the right hand, then we have also entered into the veil. And he says the anchor that we have positionally enters within the veil just like the tabernacle, later the temple, and that veil that holds in the heavenly original of the tabernacle and temple, which is there. And so it enters within the veil. What a beautiful thing. Enters within the, uh, I like here it says the inner side, the inner side. We won't have time to develop all this because I want to go back and check out the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament, but at least we get finished with the verse. And uh, so we'll see that. But we have a number of places where the word veil is used in the book of Leviticus. Uh, it talks about the holy place inside the veil brings uh, bring its blood inside the veil Leviticus 16 15 he shall not go into the veil only once a year and then bringing a sacrifice uh, they are the other people are outside the veil of the testimony over and over this word is used in Leviticus to describe the separation between the holy and the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is the presence of God. Remember that his Shekinah glory would come down and it would stay over the Holy of Holies and it would fill with smoke that area. And of course, the children of Israel would be outside and they would see the cloud above the tent of meeting. Later, of course, we see it at the temple. And in the future, it's going to come back over the millennial temple in the future time. God has removed it in 586 from Israel and it hasn't been seen since, but will be seen again during the millennial kingdom. And so we have this word holy of holies used. It's used uh, eight times in the Old Testament, uh, eight times in the Bible, and one time right here in Hebrews, this holy place. And so the uh, veil that we find it uh, here, I'm sorry, uh, the, the veil, yeah, the veil. And so the Holy of Holies is seen a number of times. We'll take a look at these uh, uh, as we come back next time. And so here the concept of the high priest entering the Holy of Holies, he offered sacrifices for himself and the priests and the sanctuary and the tent of meeting for the altar and for all the people. So when the high priest went in, these were the things that he offered sacrifices to God one time a year for himself, for all the priests, for the sanctuary, that is the entire sanctuary, uh, 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 the tent of meeting, which included everything outside of the holy place, and uh, for the altar, the altar where the animal was sacrificed, and for all the people, and he did this once a year. This is what the priest did. Now we're going to come back next week and we're going to look at some of those passages in the Old Testament and then we'll be able to finish this section. So we see that he entered the veil and we'll finish the verse here, the chapter, and then we'll come back and get the details next week. Verse 20, that is between the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. So we're going to enter into it. We're there positionally now. He's there literally. And in the future, as we go up that anchor chain into the presence, we'll do it literally at the judgment seat of Christ into the presence of God. A forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever. So here he goes back to the concept of the priesthood. The priest did this once a year. Jesus did it once for all time, entering into the veil, just as the priest did yearly for all those things. Jesus did it once and for all. And he is now seated at the right hand of the Father inside the veil, in the Holy of Holies, in the third heaven, and became a high priest forever. 
And then he says, according to the order of Melchizedek, which brings us back and will take us down to chapter 7, which is all about Melchizedek once again. So we'll see that when we come back. But the confidence that we have and the encouragement that we have is what he was aiming at. So we want to press on toward maturity, the beginning of chapter 6. And at the end of chapter 6, we see that we have encouragement because of that anchor in the very presence of the throne room of God. And we have it because of a high priest. So the concept of the priest, what does a priest do? He intercedes on behalf of all of us. And Jesus intercedes with the Father on behalf of all of us as believers. What a glorious thing it is that we have such a great high priest. That's the emphasis of the writer of the book of Hebrews. He stresses our high priest and the encouragement we have from him and what he has done. Father, we thank you again so much for the opportunity of studying these incredible passages as they relate not only to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but to the Old Testament, the rituals, and all those things that were not for nothing, but were indeed portraying as a shadow and type of the wonderful things to come through the Messiah and the fact that he would become the greatest priest and the priest forever according to Melchizedek as we have studied in the past. And therefore we have that access and we have that advocate our lawyer, if you will, the Lord Jesus Christ, in our behalf with the Father, so that even in adversity, even in our times of sinfulness, we have an advocate to plead our case. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death on the cross. We thank you for his current position and uh, the fact that he is, for us, a priest dealing with us uh, with regard as a lawyer before his father. We thank you for all these things. Now for that one person again, who is here today without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want you to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He bore your sins. He entered into the veil for you. But you have to appropriate it for yourself. God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely appointed son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Won't you do it before you leave this morning? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And Father, we thank you again for these things. Pray that God the Holy Spirit will encourage us by the things that we have studied and cause us to recognize the connection that we have into the very throne room of your presence in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his marvelous work. We thank you for all that you are and what you do for us in this life and what we will receive as we come into eternity to meet you face to face in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his powerful name. Amen.